Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. We're really excited to present to you our first webinar for Renal Make. It's eating for energy and physical activity, something that we all need a little bit more of in our lives. And this is specifically tailored for chronic kidney disease. Ah, sorry, my words, I'm twisting my tongue. For chronic kidney disease and renal failure. So I'm just going to take a brief minute to introduce myself and the other wonderful hosts today of this webinar. Uh, my name is Sarah Hawthorne. I'm actually from Australia. I've been in California for seven years now and I'm a certified health coach. So on a daily basis, I help people live their best, best lives through eating well and making supportive lifestyle choices. Um, I'm an advisor at Renal Mate and I am the founder of My Balance and Wellness. I'm very excited to announce that we have Wilson Du joining us today on the call and he'll be talking to you, inspiring you all about um, getting active and how you as a patient can improve the quality of your life through simple daily choices. He's a kidney disease patient and advocate. He's an athlete and motivator. And also he is the renal warrior. So you can follow him online for lots of inspiring pictures and um, just follow his journey. Next up, we have Mathia. Um, she is the author of over 15 books on kidney disease. You can find those on Amazon. And she's also the founder of Renal Diet HQ. And she has wonderful recipes on her website. So feel free to check that out. Um, you'll find them very helpful. And lastly, but not least, we have Jennifer Zappala. She's a certified personal trainer um, and amazingly a kidney donor. So she has had a transformative journey as well where she lost 35 pounds and really changed and improved the quality of her life. Uh, Wilson, we just wanted to uh, mention right how big of a case that this is in the US. Um, kidney disease is a really expensive um, disease with the healthcare system. Do you want to just walk us through sort of the stats on that? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, right now um, we're looking at uh, over 30 million people affected that suffering from CKD in, in the United States. You know, the, the, the sad thing is, is that a lot of people, um, they don't know that they have it until they actually have to go through dialysis. So that's, that's roughly about 10% of the, the population. It's, you know, a $42 billion uh, cost, um, you know, uh, for, uh, for uh, chronic kidney disease, including 32.9 billion for, uh, for ESRD. So it's a huge, it's a huge thing. And it's, you know, um, I, I'll talk a little bit more about it later, but you know, one of the biggest things that I got from um, meeting a lot of nurses and uh, technicians up and down the coast of California is that the same thing that they're, they're saying all the time is that the chairs are getting filled up uh, and business is getting busier and that you know, the patients are getting younger and younger. So yeah. you know, that's why I'm glad we're... we're yeah, so it's really about prevention, isn't it? Preventative Absolutely. healthcare. And that's what we're here to in empower you with today is the power of knowledge. Absolutely. So on the agenda, we have Wilson kicking things off with his Renal Warrior story. Um, we're going to be talking about the importance of physical activity and how you can incorporate it into your daily life. We're going to be doing a little talk about the formula for energy and health. And it may be a little bit more simple than you thought. And lastly, we're going to do what, when, and how to eat for energy, followed by a Q&A where you get to ask your pressing questions, and our panel of experts are going to answer those for you. All right. So, over to you, Wilson. All right. So, uh, again, Wilson do the Reno War. I'm very excited to be on here. Thank you very much for, for having me as part of this. And, um, you know, the, the Renal War story goes is, you know, I, I was diagnosed with uh, kidney disease back in June of 2016. And um, within a few months later, I had to go through a dialysis through an emergency session. At the time I was diagnosed, I was uh, a little over 300, uh, 300 pounds, 315 pounds, and um, was left in a wheelchair, hospitalized for weeks, muscles atrophied. Uh, doctor pretty much told me if I wanted to survive, I needed to get a kidney transplant, but unfortunately, I would not qualify for one due to my weight. I couldn't exercise because I was hospitalized and in a wheelchair, couldn't walk, and 
So it was damn near impossible uh, when the doctor told me to lose 100 pounds. It's like telling me to lose 1,000 pounds. Yeah. But um, there, there came a point in time where I, I hit a crossroads and I decided to choose life. It was, you know, a decision either continue on with, uh, either stop dialysis and stop or continue on with it. But if I continue on with this, I would have to fight. So after that day, I didn't look back and I, I picked myself up. I started walking um, no matter how painful and the walk just evolved into down the street, down the block, onto a bike, one mile, two mile, five miles. And then we just completed a 550 miles uh, up and down the coast of California from the Bay Area, San Francisco, all the way down to San Diego, California. You know, this was just to prove uh, to all the patients out there to let them know that, you know, it, it may seem impossible in the beginning. It may seem difficult, but, you know, little by little, and it all started with, you know, a, 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 a 10 foot walk to the porch. And this is what it evolved to. I kept my head down two years later. Here I am, 130 pounds lost just to show uh, especially other patients that it is possible. I, I know how it feels. I know it's difficult. I've been there. And I'm here to let you know that it will get better if you allow it to. Trust me. Believe me. So that's, that's my story. Wow. That is really motivating and really powerful. It almost drew a little tear to my eye just <laughs> feel, uh, being there with you through that experience. You. Uh, Jennifer, would you like to share with us um, some of your favorite ways and how we can get on how we can get started with physical activity. It seems daunting at first, right? But surely there's something we can do to get started and then gradually build on that. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm, I'm excited to be a part of this and I hope the information you take today, I know it could be overwhelming right now, but for everybody, just like Wilson said, you know, small little steps will get you to those big steps. And so that's where you need to start with. You need to start with little steps. And the one thing I want to emphasize is that uh, some, some of you at home, you know, maybe thinking, oh, you know what, I got to get to the gym. I got to, I got to get a membership or whatever it is. I need a trainer, whatever. You don't necessarily need all that right at this moment. So let's start thinking a little bit on the, the small end, just to get you moving, doing some things that you haven't been doing already. And so if that is, uh, you have the opportunity to walk around your uh, apartment, your house, your backyard, depending on where you are, your climate, whatever it is, let's think about little things. So if you're able to drive, and you can drive to the mall and you have to do your daily task or even go food shopping. And we'll talk about nutrition in a little bit. Why don't you start by parking a little further away from the front door of the, of the, the, the supermarket. And this way you get the little extra steps in. If you have to go to the mall, the holidays are coming up to, to buy some presents. Why don't you go a little bit extra earlier and walk around the mall if you're able to. This way, maybe four times around the mall, you'd be surprised like that equals up almost to a mile. Uh, or little steps of just getting up and down in your chair, uh, doing little things like that, leg raises in your chair. Little things every day will add up and every day you do a little bit, you'll get to that, that goal of setting uh, that you'll set so that you can get into a bigger and better exercise program. But start, start small and what today's uh, accomplishment is, tomorrow you're gonna do even better. So don't worry about what your, the, the big goal at the end of it, start small with little smart, small goals that every day you can achieve that you know your body can achieve, but at least do your best to try that. Right. Yeah. And one thing I wanted to quickly add there is make it fun. Like pick something that you love to do because that's the- Absolutely. It's going to be sustainable, right? If you Absolutely. sign up for a gym and you hate gyms, you're never going to go. <laughs> so well, that's the thing. Yeah. And that's the thing. A lot of times people jump in, you know, to the, it's, it's in all or, you know, I have to do everything all in. And that's not necessarily what you have to do. You can start and do things that's in small increments and then maybe one day and you, you may be ready and maybe you won't be. That's not a problem. There's plenty of things you can do outside in your environment or believe it or not, even in your own home, even without gym equipment, quote unquote, that'll get you to your goals. It's just, it's basically changing your mind and creating that mindset that you can do this. And we are here also to support you and make you achieve it. Yeah. If you love to dance, move your body and dance, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Whatever's going to get you to move. Let's do it. So now I'm going to speak about the formula for energy and health. Um, I work with a lot of clients and I always tell them the most simple thing you can do is just maximize what the body needs. So this is good nutrition. We're going to talk a lot about whole foods today, nutritional density. Um, Mathia is an expert in that, particularly for kidney disease. Um, but I'm talking about vitamins, minerals, uh, protein, good fats, antioxidants, which is basically eating all the colors of the rainbow. Um, and also just getting sunshine 
and water. That's basically the raw materials that the body needs to thrive and function optimally. So if you're doing that and making a mindful choice to do that on a regular basis, you're going to be doing your body a big favor. The next thing is to minimize the things that are no longer serving your body. And I think in the modern world these days, stress is one of the biggest ones. So if you can just simply do some deep breathing exercises or practice mindfulness, maybe you're into meditation and yoga, that's going to be giving you a really good head start on achieving your health goals just by taming chronic stress, which can you know, create excess inflammation in the body and upset our immune systems. Lastly, you want to prioritize the things that support you to feel and look your best. That's daily physical activity, getting good sleep. You know, I'm an eight hour girl myself, but if I can get 10, I'll take it. <laughs> um, even just getting anything but over six is a really good start. Um, making sure that you stay hydrated, making sure that you have a community around you that's supporting you with your health goals. Um, so you've got meaningful relationships with your partner, your parents, pets, your kids, your friends, and, and that's what's really going to set you up to thrive. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, as I said, I'm a certified health coach and I live in the Bay Area. So I regularly take people on healthy food shopping tours. Um, we do cooking workshops together and I really handhold them through adopting new food habits and lifestyle um, choices in their daily lives. So I want to talk about the five pillars of health. The first one is nutrition, which Mathia is going to touch on in greater detail in just a moment. Uh, as I mentioned, sleep is really important as well. Daily physical activity, supportive relationships, and um, having a mindfulness practice to man manage modern day stress. Okay, Mathia, over to you. Oh, can't hear you. <clears throat> <laughs> Sorry, I need to unmute. Uh, hi, this is Mathia Ford. I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist, and I'm a kidney disease specialist and owner of renaldiethq.com. I've been a registered dietitian for over 20 years, and the last eight years, I've specialized in the needs and nutritional concerns of kidney disease patients from stage three to dialysis to transplant. And I'm happy to be here today to talk to you about how to eat for energy with kidney disease. Um, sometimes people with kidney disease feel tired because of other reasons than eating too much processed foods or not exercising. So one of those reasons is typically anemia. So if you're anemic, make sure that you're continuing to eat iron rich foods and taking the medications and supplements your physician has prescribed. But I want to talk about what are whole foods in our diet. Whole foods are the things that we're going to encourage you to eat more of. So you're probably wondering what those are. And those are items that are not overly processed. Processing removes some of the nutrients that the food has naturally. And sometimes these are replaced with artificial ingredients to mimic the nutritional profile of the original food. It's better to eat the whole food without the processing or to eat foods that are less processed, so to speak. So what are some examples? Whole grain versus white flour, for example. <laughs> Nutrients like fiber and B vitamins are removed in the processing to make the white or all-purpose flour that we're used to seeing, and then vitamins are added back to meet governmental guidelines for nutrition. It's better to eat the whole grain, which is less processed and still has that fiber and those nutrients that were naturally in it, or apple juice versus apples. Apples contain fiber and other nutrients that are lost when an apple is turned into apple juice and then pasteurized. A whole apple takes you a little longer to eat, helps you feel more full, and is likely fewer calories than you would drink in a cup of juice because a serving is four ounces and most people take in way more than that. So try to eat foods that the ingredient list is five or less and you can pronounce all the foods on the ingredient list. Most whole foods don't even contain a label like fresh fruits, vegetables, meats, and eggs. So another piece of advice I'd like to give you is to eat a rainbow of foods. Our standard American diet is mainly processed and lacks color and texture. So think of your typical meal, chicken is brown, potatoes or rice are white, and corn or green beans lack a little bit nutritionally, especially if you eat just those couple of items. So look at your plate and make sure it's colorful, not that bland beige color. Consuming a variety of fresh or frozen fruits and vegetables 
means you're getting fiber that you need and a supply of vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients that can't be supplied in a multivitamin. So think about your plate and make your plate about a fourth protein and the rest of it fruits and vegetables. Eat fruit for dessert if you want something sweet. Just make sure that it's a whole fruit. So your cooking method is also important. Steaming vegetables means they retain more nutrients than boiling them. Eating them fresh without cooking, like in a salad or as a snack, is the best way to enjoy all the nutrition that they provide. So how can you get started on changing your diet? Check out your local, far local farmer's market to buy in-season fruits and vegetables. Get to know your farmers. Learn more about the items that are grown. Many farmers are not certified organic because that's expensive, but they do follow many of the best practices like using fewer pesticides and chemicals to grow the food. Read your ingredient labels. In read your food labels, ingredients especially. Ingredients are listed in the United States, at least, in order of the most volume in the recipe. So if something has a type of sugar or sodium in the first five ingredients, it's likely a more processed food and higher in sugar. Eating at home and making dishes, like I said, five ingredients or less from scratch, more often than you eat out at fast food or quick service restaurants. I have lots of simple recipes on my website, like Sarah mentioned, in small portions, just two to four servings. And talk to your family and friends about your desire to change. Ask for their help and support to keep you on track and when you have group gatherings. So let's talk about kidney disease friendly whole foods. Since nutritional recommendations vary based on your stage of kidney disease, please continue to follow whatever guidelines your dietitian provided to you for your specific needs. But incorporate more whole foods that are less processed. Start by looking for foods in their natural state, like in the produce section of the store or the farmer's market. Eating a spinach and lettuce salad with a fresh grilled chicken breast, some nuts or seeds like walnuts, a fresh pear and a vinaigrette dressing that you mixed at home is a better meal than a bread, breaded chicken breast, some rice and some green beans. So I do have a um, vinaigrette dressing and recipe with some fresh berries on my website that Natalia will send out the, in the follow-up emails. So you'll have access to that as an example. And I encourage you to use less salt and more flavor. Use salt-free spices. Think about using like red pepper flakes for a zing instead of salt. So I wanna finish out by talking about how change happens and how you can create magical meals. Sometimes it happens quickly, sometimes it happens a little bit at a time. Wilson talked about just taking a couple steps and then the next day taking a few more. Jen talked about that too. And I just wanna encourage you to pick just one or two things. Don't go all overboard and try to make those changes and every day will be a little better. Fantastic. Thanks, Sarah. Wilson, isn't that exactly the kind of advice on nutrition you were hoping for so long ago before oh, yeah. you started all this journey? Yeah, absolutely. It was, you know, because the thing is, is just getting diagnosed, it was overwhelming with, you know, every, like, and you think you have to change one, 180 degrees, like change everything about your diet. And, you know, I, I figured out, you know, that is, is maybe a recipe for disaster. But if you incorporate things one step at a time, maybe... For myself, it was once a week, either taking taking away something or adding something. Yep. That made it a gradual progress. And all of a sudden, you look back and it's like six months. And you're like, whoa, I changed all of this? Like, whoa. Yeah. And that's where the transformation starts. Yeah, and Absolutely. as a health coach, I can confirm that. Slow and steady <laughs> is the most sustainable way. Those that think you can drastically shift everything overnight end up you know, disappointing themselves and failing. So it's all about those baby steps. Um, now we're going to talk about briefly what, when, and how to eat for energy. Um, I always recommend just having set meals. Uh, a lot of people habitually snack, but it's not really so necessary. Allow yourself to have one optional snack a day um, when you need it most, but try to put those bags of chips down and <laughs> all those temptations, put them away, um, and really just focus on a wholesome breakfast, a substantial lunch, and a nourishing dinner. Um, eating hygiene is important too, guys. Chew, chew, chew your food. You're going to recognize when you're satisfied if you slow down and take your time with your meal. Um, those people that rush their food, uh, they often overeat because they haven't listened to their body's um, hunger satiety cues and rec to recognize when they've actually had enough to stop. 
Um, and for fueling workouts, my favorite little tip is to have something simple like a piece of fruit and some nuts before your workout, just to give you that bit of energy to climb those stairs or go for that light jog. Um, and then afterwards have something with a bit of protein in it. Um, if, if you're someone that likes to have boiled eggs or something after you work out, that's a great way to repair any muscle, muscle tissues that have been damaged during your workout, give you that extra energy. So we've come to almost the end of our webinar. Um, we're gonna be doing more of these in the new year. So stay tuned in January and February of 2019, uh, where we dive deeper into the kidney diet. Um, we're looking for your feedback as well after this webinar. So please tell us what you thought, if you'd like to hear something else next time, what your favorite part of the webinar was or what you thought wasn't as valuable. Everything is really good information for us. Um, and you can have a look at uh, Mathia's wonderful recipes, as we've mentioned, um, on the Renal Diet IQ. Uh, we'll be featuring those and sending you some links as well. And if you've got any questions, please do reach out, coaching at livezo.com. Um, and I guess now we're going to open up that wonderful question and answer section where you get to um, ask us your pressing questions and have the panel of experts answer them to the best of their ability. So let's have a look at what the first one is. Okay, let's have a look here. Natalia. Uh, yes, hi. So I'll join, I'll just read, upload some of the questionnaire. Um, we have questionnaire submitted prior uh, the webinar uh, with our following at Renal Warrior uh, 2016 at RenalMate. So the que first question is about what are the good healthy snacks for the hemodialysis patients who are really busy, uh, still working, and preferably um, they should be also diabetes friendly? Uh, so Mathia, Thera, this question to you, um, what will be the best snacks uh, that you recommend? Right. So I'll, I can answer that. Um, with hemodialysis, you're usually concerned about fluid consumption, um, depending on the type of hemodialysis. So diabetic friendly is going to be more just plain water um, and not sugar, sugary drinks. But snacks, I like to think about things that are <clears throat> kind of um, longer to digest. So you want to find things that have fiber and also um, a little bit of energy that might take a little longer. So I like carrots, I like broccoli, I like celery, um, any sort of uh, cauliflower if you like that, cucumber. So taking those things and then adding a protein to it like some nuts or some peanut butter, um, low sugar peanut butter they make, there's low sodium peanut butter. Um, so peanut butter or some type of nut butter, it doesn't have to be peanut butter. That makes a good protein. Um, I love nuts with that too. Mm -hmm. You also can have um, like instead of, I, I like the idea of a bento box. So a bento box is when you kind of have this little box with a bunch of individual things, um, containers. So you might have like a, you know, six by six box and you have like three little containers in there. And you could put separate things into there. So you might put your lettuce in one container and then like some cheese or some nuts um, in another container and then you're dressing in another container. And when it's time to eat it, instead of it being soggy, um, you can put it all together and eat that just as a little snacker really quick. So I love that with just maybe some crackers, whole grain crackers and um, some deli meat or... Um, you know, shredded chicken or something like that, that you can just have a small amount of. It's already portion controlled for you. It's easy to bring along. You can stick that in your um, lunch bag. And um, so I think those are some snack ideas. Mm -hmm. And just start thinking about what you really enjoy, um, you know, eating, but smaller portions probably. And I agree with the idea that Sarah said, we're not so much snacking, really try to stick to more your meal times. Right. Our body needs that time to digest and um, allow our stomach to empty. And then 
um, eat our next meal so we can get that hungry feeling and let our body tell us that we're ready for our next meal. Very well said. And it goes back to your point about whole foods. Make your snacks count and make them uh, full of whole foods. So fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds, things that come in their whole form, but form versus things that are really packaged and processed. Because a lot of people think snacks are packaged foods that are quick and easy to grab and go like chips and popcorn and things, right? I have a question on processed foods. Um, if I process my own food, is that okay? Like if I took <laughs> shrimp and I grinded it up and I made shrimp, like is, is that okay? Like I, yeah. from a food standpoint, like if it's processed yeah. that way, if I did it? That's a good question. I think, you know, processed foods that are naturally processed, like you might make homemade pesto or hummus. Yes right? That's yeah. great. You're turning something into something else that's even better. But the processed foods that you find at the supermarket usually have additives like preservatives, sugars, stabilizers, colors, um, sodium. natural flavors, sodium, excessive amounts of sodium, right? So uh, these are the things that can really have health consequences if we eat them too often and the standard American diet is full of this stuff. People really need to stop depending on it and go back to real fresh whole foods like what Mathia was talking about at the farmer's market or at the, in the produce section of your supermarket. I also, oh, go ahead Wilson. No, I was saying I didn't know the science behind it. The other day I was processing some shrimp and I was like, I don't know if I should eat this, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I figure, you know, it's okay. I'm, I'm controlling it, so. Well, I was just going to say with hemodialysis, you tend to have a higher protein need than before dialysis. So your protein needs go up significantly just because of the loss during the dialysis process. So if you want something that you can take with you, if you can find a recipe for some nice little protein type cookies or snacks that wouldn't have a ton of sugar in them and you can make up, you know, five or six of them and then take those with you and use that as your afternoon snack. If you're making it, you're controlling how much salt and sugar is put in it. And that way um, it's a good healthy snack versus buying a protein bar at the store, which has all these other things that we don't necessarily know what all the components are that are being put into it. So anyway, yeah. that's a great point. Just to everybody out there also is that, um, you know, just to let you know that I used to eat out all day. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner was all going out. And after I start, after I got sick and I started cooking, um, you get used to it. After a while, it's diff it's more difficult to go out to eat because the foods are a little bit too rich in flavor, a little bit too rich in salt. Um, but as you cook on your own, you actually start um, you you start developing a taste, and things your your taste buds will adjust. So it might be you know it might be pretty bad in the beginning, but after a while you get used to it, and you know you just change your whole mindset on it. Just yeah, cooking is the key to health. That's for sure. You can control everything that goes in that meal that way. Uh, and start with what you know. Sorry, we'll start with what you know. If you just know how to scramble eggs and add some veggies, that's great. Do that, and if you steaming vegetables is easy, right? Mathia and um, making sure that you roast things as well. Like that's a very simple cooking technique that you can master straight away and then start just adding variety into the foods that you're roasting or boiling or steaming or blanching. Um, and before you know it, you're going to be a, a little master chef. <laughs> I really appreciate it uh, for uh, this great conversation. Uh, we still have a few more questions uh, coming up. So one of the questions uh, regarding the diet, uh, so very often for the hydration, we hear water. What are other good sources for the hydration for CKD patients uh, to make sure they can meet uh, a CKD patients prior dialysis when they just stay, need to stay hydrated? And then for ESRD patients, when they're already on dialysis, how they can still stay hydrated enough, but also manage their uh, fluid allowances on a daily basis? So, Wilson, do you want to talk? I was going to answer uh, the uh, for patients, but go ahead and prior to uh, seeking air. When you're... Okay, so I was just going to say that you may not want to hear this, but water is the best thing, um, especially, you know, filtered, purified water that doesn't have um, a lot of chemicals in it. But add lemon to that water, add lime, um, do some things that are 
like I was talking about cucumber before. I love when I go to the spa because they slice cucumber and put it in the water and it has this really good flavor. But try those types of things. Um, as far as anything like a soda, we always recommend clear sodas because they have less, less phosphorus in them. Um, but think about um, like tea and coffee are typically okay. Um, you just can't add a ton of sweeteners or sugars to those because you really are trying to manage that amount of sugar that you're putting in your body. Um, so another thing I like to do, especially whether they're on dialysis or not, is thinking about fluids in different states. So you have your liquids, but then you also, you can freeze um, like ice cubes made of um, some sort of sweetened, like with the, with the cucumber in it, and put that in your drink and then it's over time I'm gonna release into the to the um, drink or for example on dialysis I like to use ice chips um, you know jello ice cream all those things count as fluid when you're on dialysis so you do have to be cautious of that but um, you know ice chips and more solid forms of things that are fluid tend to just give you that mouth feel and satisfy you a little bit more than I'm um, just drinking like a water, um, glass of water, or glass of juice. So Wilson? Yeah, well, you know, um, if you're on dialysis, I'm on hemodialysis, so I'm restricted to, I believe it's a liter a day. Number one, best way, sweat it out. <laughs> <laughs> but number two, um, you know, uh, for me, uh, I... You know, this is my own technique, so it works for me. It might not work for everybody else. Is that days of dialysis, I'm pretty tired out. And so I'm resting that day, and I, I limit my fluids that day just for medication, maybe a little bit with meals, and I, it's very limited. I maybe drink half a bottle of water. I know that may or may not be good because the next day that I'm not on dialysis, I, I, I try to train. And so that will allow me to be a little bit more liberal on my fluids for that day. So I, you know, as I'm working out, I can drink, I, I, I can drink a little bit more because if I'm drinking a lot during days of dialysis, the next day when I train, sometimes I can go over on fluids. Um, me, I, I've always been a person who liked fluids. I like to hydrate, but unfortunately with dialysis, you're, you're not able to do it as much. So um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's just managing that way. And typically when I do that, where I keep it low on days of dialysis, the next day I can drink a lot and two liters is a lot to drink in a day for me now and so that that's how I control it you know I I, I, I sandbag it to the next day excellent uh, thanks uh, so I have another question from Bob uh, so um, a question actually particular to Jennifer uh, so Jennifer you went recently uh, through organ donation and uh, could you tell us what was the preparation process and recovery process uh, that is the first question. And then we have second question from Ben. Um, there are more than 80% of uh, dialysis patients experience back pain. And they say this is the main cause why they have low energy and that prevents them exercising because they're concerned of injuries. Mm -hmm. uh, so since you're a personal trainer, you have a lot of expertise in the subject matter. Could you share with us, with our patients, what are possible workouts, a way to manage your back pain? Jennifer? Sure, no problem. Yes, thank you. So uh, yes, uh, three and a half months now I am uh, transplant. My, uh, my, my, my mother was my recipient. And so we're three and a half months out of transplant. Preparation wise, uh, I have to say, uh, you know, we go through as a donor, and even as a recipient for transplant, you go through an extensive uh, preparation, uh, exams, tests, blood work, uh, urine analysis, and so forth. So uh, that wasn't too much of a difference for my everyday life. And I, I wanted to maintain that so that I didn't, I don't know what, trick, you know, trick everything. So uh, just kept going to doing what I, what I do, maintain a good BMI, exercise, keep my cardiovascular healthy, uh, feel strong. Um, going into surgery and then coming out of surgery after donation, I, I felt okay. And uh, recovery wasn't, wasn't so bad. Just, you know, just kind of pain from surgery itself. But other than that, I think uh, mentally you, you feel good that you donated something and you feel kind of strange that you just donated your organ and, 
as my mother sits next to me in most of the, the days to know that my kidney is right there. It's kind of a weird situation. Uh, but in, 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 in all in all, it feels, uh, I felt really good. Uh, what I would say to anybody going through that process, recipient or donor, uh, is to just maintain a healthy lifestyle. And, and as we've been speaking of with, with eating whole foods and monitoring what you're eating, how you're eating and so forth, that's really going to maintain a healthy lifestyle. Even if you're not ready now for transplantation uh, uh, to receive um, a kidney, just to basically live a healthy lifestyle. As far as back pain, back pain is, is by far the number one cause of, you know, reasons why many people go to the doctors. Uh, is because they do experience back pain. Some is chronic, some are caused by various things, and some are just typical things that we're not doing to help ourselves out. And so with today's way that we live, uh, we're constantly on technology, whether you're sitting at home, at a computer, watching TV, on your phone, on your laptop, whatever it is, or if you work in an office. The way our posture is, we've graduated to this unacceptable way of posture, our rounded shoulders, constantly looking down, our neck is tilted. So our bodies are starting to conform to this way that we live. And the way we can adjust that is to be more conscious of our posture. Uh, and if you're not working in the field outside, or if you're not driving in a car, or whatever that may be, and you're, you're at home uh, through your course of, your, of what you're going through, there's still things that you can do to prevent bad posture, if, uh, if I may use that. And so what I do tell my clients, um, you know, right off the bat is that two things that are going to help you remember your posture. And so if, if a client is working at a desk, I tell them to put a little post-it on the top of their computer screen, just the word posture. Uh, if you have a TV or something that you're on, whatever it is, things are going to help you. And that means shoulders go back. Uh, keep your shoulders back, or better yet, if you think about your shoulder blades that are in, the, in your back, uh, those big things, those trapezoids, if you want to imagine trying to get those shoulder blades in your back pocket of your jeans, that's what you want to try to do. And that's going to bring those shoulders back. It may cause a little tension at first, but after a while, if you could think of doing that when you walk, when you start to get gradual walking, uh, you, that's going to help keep those shoulders back and posture and your neck in line with your spine. Because what we're doing is we're pushing our neck forward, <laughs> taking it out of line of our spine. And that's what causes some of the back pain. The other thing is we're laying around too much. And so if you have the opportunity to stand and get up and do some stretching, if you have somebody at home and if you're not as 100% stable with your balance at this point, and if somebody can help you, even sitting in the chair by putting your hands over your head and stretching to one side to the other, stretch to the one side, hold for a couple seconds, and then come back to center, release that tension, get your breath. If you're a little bit dizzy, please don't go forward. If you feel okay, go to the other side. If you can do this while standing up, that's great. Again, always uh, seek professional help from a doctor if you're ready to do those things. But I think basically getting up and moving uh, will help release some of that tension in the lower back, uh, will pre prevent us from slouching and you know creating bad posture, uh, and just keeping awareness of our entire body when we're walking around and doing things, especially on our phone, computer, TV, so on and so forth. Those are just some of the tips right now I think that can help you know maybe start decreasing that back pain. Hope that helps. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, we have the last question, and actually this question has been asked uh, uh, by a couple participants in our upcoming fitness challenge. Um, there are a number of patients who are on uh, dialysis, and they are um, been on dialysis for more than five, seven years, and they are already doing a good job managing their health, but sometimes it just really feels that you have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, what will be your suggestion when patients more than five years on dialysis have a busy lifestyle, how they can reassess themselves and how they can do better, um, as well as keeping daily motivation? Wow. Is, that question to, is that question to me, Jen, or to anybody? Oh, uh, just uh, a question by our participants, maybe. Oh, great. Could you suggest uh, some of the things for... ESRD patient who on dialysis more than five, seven years on the nutrition, uh, since, uh, um, you know, it's a lot this of this probably, balance. This is probably, uh, Jen, something you can answer. You probably see a lot of the excuses all the time, not just pertaining to uh, patients, but just people in general, right, to keep the motivation going after five or six years? Absolutely. It's, 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 uh, 
it's not easy. Uh, you know, this is not easy. This is a, a mindset. And that's really what it comes from. Because there's so many ways out there and tricks and trades. And everybody's looking for that magic pill. Regardless if you have kidney disease or not. You know, people want to say, I got to lose weight and you know, 10 pounds by next week. And it's just not. <laughs> it's, is it possible? It is possible. But that is not the healthy way to do it. And for long-term success. And the way to have long-term success, whether or not you're, you're going through kidney disease uh, or not, is you have to change your mindset. And so when you get to that plateau, right, even, even us professionals, when we, we are exercising all the time and we're eating healthy, we all do hit our plateau. You sometimes have to take a step back and you do have to reassess. And what worked for you five years ago may not work for you now because you now your body has changed. And much to Wilson's point earlier about when you start cooking your own food and beforehand you, were, you had a, a certain acquire for taste and then now you cook your own food and your taste buds are like, what is going on? And then all of a sudden now you try to eat out and you're like, I don't like that anymore. That's the same progression of trying to keep motivated with either physical activity or nutrition. Sometimes you do have to change it up. Sometimes you do have to take a little bit of a break to just jump back into it, reset the mind, reset your goals, and then just keep moving forward because you will eventually get to where you want to go. And then when you hit that goal, you make another one and you go again. Right. To Jen's point, um, you know, it's, this is cliche and, 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 you know, people probably hear it a lot. It's, it's not really a diet. It's a lifestyle change. So that's it. That's it. Yeah. If you make it a lifestyle change, it's not going to be where, okay, uh, you know, this is things getting boring. What's the next, what's the next thing? It's actually, be, if it's a lifestyle, this is how you live your life. And so, you know, you're, it's, it's, and, and exactly what Jen's saying, you have to kind of know where you're going, know where your goals are, know where you're headed. You can plan for that, however it is, and, and make it a lifestyle change. So that way, because diets are only long lasting, they only last, you know, a month or two months, however long you have this diet for. But if you if you make a lifestyle change, you're going to gradually evolve whatever you're doing, whether it be working out, whether it be dieting, and it just becomes part of you. So you're you're constantly trying to improve yourself naturally. 100% agree with that. Yeah. Uh, so the only thing I would add is that a lot of times after that long, we start to um, see ourselves as dialysis and forget that we are a person aside from that. And so if you're getting bored, if you're getting, um, you know, need motivation, find those things that inspire you that maybe inspired you before, but all of a sudden you're doing dialysis for 20 hours a week or 16 hours a week, and you feel like you lost that. What is something that maybe you can bring into dialysis that is not food related that rewards you? Um, and I agree with the whole thing about um, knowing where you're going. So if you know, hey, I want to cook more food at home, I want to do better, I want to change this a little bit, then, <clears throat> and I know typically on dialysis, you may be on a fixed income because you maybe can't work a full-time job yeah. or those types of things. So those, those things, where do you want to go? If you want to cook more food at home, what are the steps between cooking food at home and what you're doing now to get you where you want to go. Maybe you want to cook one day a week at home and stop eating out one meal a week. You know, that's a small goal. That would be fine. Do that for a couple of weeks. But how do you get there? You can't cook food at home unless you have food from the grocery store. Right. And you can't pick what you're going to buy at the grocery store until you have a recipe. So right. start with realizing, okay, I need to plan what I want to eat that night. And then I'm going to buy the food and I'm going to cook that recipe. And I'm going to make sure it's a night when I have the time to do it. And um, I, maybe it's not a dialysis day because I'm tired that day, but maybe it's a, another day. So all those things, if you know what, how, where you want to go, you can pick the steps to get there. So when you're not motivated, it's because you haven't thought about where you want to go next. And maybe you started feeling like dialysis is your life. And I want you to forget that dialysis is your life. Dialysis is like a job almost because you go to it 16 or 20 hours a week, but it's not you. So you're a grandma, you're a family member, you're an aunt, you're a father, all those things. And so how do you want to enrich that part of your life? Because food is, is love and health and the things that we do with other people, but it's also that community and that in, engagement that we have. So if you want to exercise more and you have a spouse or a friend or whatever, sit, let's set a goal together and say, Hey, on my non-dialysis days, I want to start walking or I want to do these things. But, um, that motivation 
is going to have to come from within. It's not going to be something that I tell you, but if there's something you've really wanted to do, maybe you really want to go on a trip or something, pick a way you're going to figure out how to get there. Um, but that would be my encouragement. So as much as I love food and cooking and all that type of stuff, um, you have to know the steps between where you are now and where you want to go and then take those small steps. Don't think of it as I want to cook seven meals a day, seven meals a week at home. Think about the small steps you can take and just do that next step. Don't worry about the big goal. Just start taking those little steps. Very well. is, uh, is, is eating, uh, is cooking at home, can it be cheap? Oh, absolutely. It can be, um, you know, first of all, the amount of protein that we eat as Americans is probably twice what we actually need, whether we're healthy it, as a healthy, regular person. So um, on pre-dialysis, you need less protein, usually two to three ounces per meal. And then dialysis, depending on your size, you know, you might need four or five ounces a meal, but you don't need an eight ounce steak. You know, you need a two or three ounce um, sandwich. Or or, eight ounce steak. Huh? Sure I don't need an eight ounce steak. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So just, it is smaller portions. And um, when you're cooking at home, so there's, there's a whole thing about organic and um, non-GMO and all that stuff. And while I think that's, there's no proof that non-GMO is, is a, um, a, a factor. I know there's a lot of people that believe in that. So I don't want to get into that discussion, but organic, you truly can, you know, there's some that are worse organically than others. And so if you want to buy maybe apples that are organic, but not necessarily worry about other things where you peel the skin and you're not going to get that anyway. Um, those choices can be a good balance. Um, but I just, you can eat less expensive, especially at home, but I know, so I'm sorry, I'm going on, but, um, <laughs> So a lot of times people, it's just them or just them and a spouse. And so it may be easier to eat out at McDonald's or another place because it's less expensive to have that smaller portion than to make a bigger portion of food at home. So what I would encourage you to do is think about how you can use that food later. So if you buy and roast a chicken, you eat your portion of chicken and then you shred that chicken and use it on a salad the next day and maybe you freeze some of it and maybe you use it in a soup in a couple days. So that rotisserie chicken might've cost you five or $7, but you can use it for three or four or five meals. But when you're, when you're planning, you're thinking a little bit ahead, like how can I use this turkey breast that I bought? Okay, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna eat a third of it. And then tomorrow I'm gonna make a sandwich. And then the next day I'm gonna put it on a salad. So using leftovers you know, and, and sometimes it's easier to buy a little bit in bulk and then use those over time. So Sarah might have some ideas about that too. Yeah, I know we have to wrap up in just a minute, um, but I would love to just add one point to your wonderful response to that question. Um, I always like to go to the farmer's market at the very end because they're basically throwing food away. At <laughs> they want to get rid of it. They don't want to take it back with them. So things and yeah, that's great. Around. Um, that's how I like to get a lot of my plant foods. Um, I go to the supermarket and I look for sales. Have a look at the price of, say, broccoli compared to cauliflower. Maybe cauliflower is $6 a pound because it's, say, not in season or something. But for some reason, they've got broccoli for half the price. So pay attention. Get things that are on sale and load up. Get things in bulk as well. Um, you can always freeze things. Uh, you can always cook things up and then put them in containers and freeze them for later. Um, so it's really about just buying in bulk, going to the farmer's market at the end of the market to try and get everything they're throwing away and then looking for the sales as well. It's a great way to save on food shopping. Um, I wanted to thank all of our wonderful hosts here. We had a wonderful panel of experts sharing their knowledge and expertise with you and all of our guests that joined us on the webinar today. Please do stay tuned for more coming in the new year. Um, and again, feedback welcome from this webinar, but we hope that you at least found one valuable tip that you could implement in your life starting today um, and stick with it remember it's all about baby steps we'll be seeing you again in the new year thank you so much for joining us bye everybody bye bye, bye. bye. Wonderful.